Hello everyone, today we talked about the Byzantine half-armored horse of the late 6th century. This dating is um, relatively vague because, telling the truth, copyright issues aside, there is actually no such thing like um, a, a picture, an uh, iconographic source, in fact, representing early examples of Byzantine horse armor. Um, so, I have just this picture here that is not entirely, um, you know, detailed. We will now look at some of the features of this armor. And also talk about the uh, the horse races. We could say that what we're describing here is not particularly different from a Sasanian half-armored horse. All right? Actually, they're pretty much the same. We know what this time in history is about. Um, this is essentially the age of the pseudo Maurice's uh, Strategicon. We have perhaps actually to look a bit more in depth uh, into the period um, for our Byzantine history series. But you know what, what's the situation here? There is a, uh, a struggle, like an ongoing um, conflict between the Sasanian Empire and the Byzantine one that will be terminated actually with the Battle of Nineveh of 632, which is yet another time the Roman Empire actually crushed the Persian state that fragmented ruinously, but because of the fact that the Iranian plateau was not really to be invaded and that after all the system was what was really destroyed was the Mesopotamian state. It was more centralized, but the Iranian plateau was a feudal system basically, and so from there other dynasties could reemerge and restart the game. Except this time the Arabs come around, and this um, Sasanian connections are important as far as the development of this armor that we will see now owes a lot to the Iranian but also Turkic tradition at this point. And one could go as far as saying that actually the Byzantine half armored horse men would have been distinguishable from his Sasanian counterpart among, you know, and besides the, the things like, you know, just colors, symbols, um, you know, all the identification devices that, of course, would bring these guys to recognize one another. Um, this could be extended to many other types of troops, as you understand. But there is one thing that we can't say by approximation. I have a video that is incoming specifically on this topic, the fact that the Byzantine um, horsemen at this point would have been m more likely equipped with stirrups than the same Sasanian one, right? Many people think that, that this is dating to the old days of Firepunk, at least among some questions have been um, not that often, but say repeatedly asked, that is to say, you know, how much is, you know, did the East influence uh, things like the, the rise of knighthood in the West? And, and there is this, um, say, um, attitude which I really don't like, even from great scholars like Nicole, etc., that studied iconography, archaeological evidence, a great lot, stressing the influence that especially would have arrived from the Levant and during the Crusades, as opposed to the much more impacting and sort of informing one that was already, in fact, deeply ingrained in high medieval Europe, Crusades or not, from the Migration era time, right? From centuries like the 5th, the 6th, I have a medieval knighthood playlist that actually deals exactly with this. Again, I have a video incoming exactly in the introduction of the stirrup, in the West, and in fact, seemingly did not arrive from the Persian medium, from the Near East, from the Eastern Byzantine frontier, but from the Central European one, actually from the Avars, this prevalently Turkic population that what was in, in some ways much more connected with Central Asian military uh, developments and technology, including the ancestral cataphract one and what these had evolved like into 
um, then at this point in history, the same Sasanians, right? Perhaps the last aspect is, is going too far, but why? Because the if, if you look at the, and I made, uh, made a video uh, about this in the Eurasian, for the Eurasian Stamps series, the one about the sagas, right? Because um, um, you realize that the cataphract as such is not um, merely native sort of type of warrior uh, that existed uh, without external influences in the steppe and that fundamentally the West sort of eventually adopted um, through, through these channels. But it was actually a reaction to the toughest Western incursion. You say, when? Well, when? In Alexander's times, right? It seems that the Scythians did develop essentially this heavier type of, by the way, hyper-individually skilled, uh, heavily armored horsemen, plus heavily armored horse, as a reaction against the Macedonian phalanx, and essentially the ever more beating and performing uh, armies that existed after, in fact, the uh, the Alexandrine conquest, even in, of course, like places like uh, well, Persia not too much, but let's say the, the broader surroundings of, of the Scythians, right? Uh, so, you know, where another, yes, also the Persian element. And when we talk about the cataphract tradition, however, we're talking here, in fact, Hellenistic era, right, for obvious uh, reasons, well, after Alexander. But when you look at the survival of the cataphract tradition in uh, the, say, the say, the western side of Eurasia, because, again, there are mostly, again, there is some, um, for example, development in the Indo-Scythian direction. There, there is a, that's actually a, a very um, important cradle um, of, uh, and melting, uh, you know, shop, we could say, for this craft, uh, say, this cataphract technology. In fact, it seems that the indo Kush, that those areas were the ones uh, that eventually brought to the rise of the same syrup, at least to the, you know, the heavier, the, the more resistant type degree that for the rest there were other syrups that were also of organic material and that were presumably and more widely so used um, but were not particularly documented. So we're talking about, of course, the, the very heavily cataphract warrior. We're talking about something that was, yes, coming from the Central Asian tradition, but mostly, even in, in the Indo-Scythian case, in reaction to a tougher sanitary enemy, or, uh, compared to, when I say tougher, I, I say it really in the broader sense of the, the military art and how armies, generally speaking, were sort of better armored, better... But infantry is actually the size, right? If you look at... I made a, yet another uh, episode about Eurasian steps warfare. In fact, um, how the, the, the Sarmatians met with the Romans, etc. Of course, in that time, um, in, in, in history, um, and you can argue to some extent, because of the places as well, infantry was superior to the uh, to cavalry, but generally speaking, sanitary, the sanitary art of war was superior to the one on the stand, um, which people also tend to to get confused about. At least it happened often to me to, to receive this kind of question because there is no doubt that th there is an intense um, uh, steps output right that brings even generally speaking to to, to the capacity of overrunning. The, the same sanitary civilizations, but just to the extent of, of the elite or an exhaustion of the system, and always because the steps were also desperate, and of course were in part even emptied by this phenomena, and still the sanitary world always took over the conquerors. Um, and as far as the steps are concerned, actually there's no real, real takeover, right? Um, what you see is, for example, the very heavily influenced steps. Germans were, however, still fundamentally sanitary peoples um, that basically substitute themselves as to, to, the, to the Roman army in certain areas. 
Uh, but you couldn't think the Hans, for example, to have the, the capacity, of properly the cultural tools to, to, to administrate a sedentary empire. It was, was impossible. And as they came, they basically they went away uh, as well. But all this is relevant because when we look at uh, Persia, we realize that uh, that was the, um, the, the place in which, at least for a while, the Parthian, later the Parthians, during their Arsacid times, basically cultivated the actually most compact um, concept of cataphract that we think about. Like, properly, the guy that is heavily armored, uh, uh, say, uh, individually, plus the entire horse. And this, you would think, would evolve over time, right? Instead, it's the other way around. I mean, in Sasanian times, and in times, notice that, of much greater military advancement than the the the, the Arsacid ones. The Sasanian uh, cataphract gets lighter. Actually it becomes a, 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 as far as the horse armor was concerned, a half armor uh, mount precisely. Um, and the reason being multiple ones that in a sense, are reflected even in the Roman Empire. The Romans, uh, as you know, did have complete cataphracts that were modeled after the the Arsacid, the Sarmatian tradition. And if you look at Roman military history, uh, that is definitely a you know a powerful, uh, as glorious one. You realize that these catap- these he- completely um, cataphracted horsemen never actually succeeded. Uh, to to a good extent. I mean, they could be taken down even by lighter opponents. This this is also normal to some extent. The Romans had the civilizational capacity of replicating these guys, and even attaining some important degree of um, you know of, of quality as they were. But the point being that the sanitary world in which they were prevalently using them was already more advanced. Um, than these kind of guys, right? I never made a video about that specifically. Today we talk about the, say, the 6th century, just the eastern half of the empire, but as you know, I also made a video about the battle of Argentoratum back in the day. There are instances of the, not just the whole empire, when it was not yet administratively divided, but probably even the western part, um, using literal cataphracts in the, because cataphract, as you know, is a, uh, very generic term. It simply means armor, so it doesn't even entail the, the full uh, armoredness per se. But we use it conventionally as such today, right? But even when we see this half-armored horse, right? I would say in pop culture, through video games, etc., people tend not to call the half-armored horse um, cataphract because, uh, like, mm, let's say that there is nothing even apparently at least specifically relevant about the half armored horse in as it they did exist through different eras right but there is no doubt that when we look at the 6th century in a byzantine sasanian contest and contest by the way um these powers are not just the most advanced uh, in eurasia uh, in western eurasia but they do have advanced armies in Western Eurasia, but that their heavily armored um, equestrian tradition did derive, in fact, from the cataphract. That you would say, but then, you know, if the cataphract was not that useful after all, why was it invented? Which It was, again, the response of the sap to its own inferiority, like overload to compensate the lack of, for example, heavy infantry this guy and um, in fact make it become, especially in the early tradition, a, a sort of factotum um, in terms of not just shock charge but also um, horse archery because initially and still in our Sasset time to century, we will have to um, talk about party and warfare in that sense, the guy still did both, right? Um, the Sasanian Empire instead expanding has a more capable army, it can diversify more. Um, it's just larger armored forces, again, on fundamentally a Mesopotamian statile basis that can, however, inject from the Iranian plateau and even from the, the further steps out there in the north and northeast. More this sort of 
originary uh, Iranian and at this point also Turkic because the Turks were adopting part that they were in part at least adopting this and that some Iranian warfare but really the cataphract does not belong to them in any case the, there are some relics as far as the broader antique uh, late antique era sort of survives in certain parts of, of Central Asia, etc. Uh, to diversify in the Sasanian army between a just the heavily armored shock force and the horse archery and not mixing the two things. Why it does, does, does this get rationalized? Well, because the average trooper is not uh, sort of lord slash demigod hero living out there like a knight errant in the steppe. This is something that mostly the Iranians had been having. At this point, and there is a great process of gentrification to some extent. The, the Persians definitely maintain some wilder lifestyle than, say, for example, their Roman counterpart. Um, and they have, as we just said, this uh, closer... Um, um, spring of cata cataphractness, if you want, uh, or, and or just of equestrian military culture from from Central Asia. That was the top one in the world. But it's always about a matter of combined arms. And if you have larger forces, you wanna use, for example, the ultra heavily cataphracted um, uh, arm, just essentially as a sort of reserve that. Uh, awaits for the last moment in the battle to, to charge it, and it doesn't practically have to do anything. It doesn't have to maneuver. It doesn't have to perform who knows which kind of feats, because A, the you know the, the, the equipment is just too heavy. B, um, the, the larger, for, for the individual, and the larger, of course, the, uh, the unit is, and the, the least you have to, the, the greater in proportion the chaos increases as f and, and so the also the energy expenditure especially for these heavily armored guys that have just one purpose basically to turn into pulp anything they had in front of them charging as a as a walled mass without even caring what they're going to smash in um and wiping the floor out of basically anyone uh, out there um and this bear in mind is mostly molded um within the same system of course um it's it's a bit like the birth of the cataphract of course there was a reaction from the outer side but still right it was a political and social basis for which you could develop within the iranian world that kind of warfare also because at the end of the day your fellow iranians against which you would have still been fighting um relentlessly uh, would have developed that uh, type of warrior also to crush its own equivalent, because that, in fact, was the point. Um, so the, um, the the Sasanian uh, system sort of is there is a, a fall of the age of hero from the age of heroism to to some extent. The migration era, late antiquity, is a moment of gradual uh, degradation and exhaustion of the system. Right, this is evidenced by just what I was saying before. The, also what the Arabs took advantage of uh, between the clash of these two giants. Um, there would be so much to tell about it. With never, I think Schwerpunkt made such a deep analysis of the Byzantine Sasanian struggle, but it, you know, it's a lot of stuff, as you know, and so gradually we'll get there uh, for sure. Um, and so over time, you see that the prevalent cataphract is not just the old armored guy and horse which would have caused an enormity right even the the, the byzantines for example would come out later with the nicophorian uh, time uh, cataphract right and i made a video about that and you realize how these those guys were so ultra heavy um, that yes they survive also a bit in the Comnen in the early Comnenian era but they sort of make sense only if your empire is truly just immense and you can't afford these guys to be literally the heaviest force that anybody can field to literally outpower the enemy. But there is also, in fact, the idea of cost-benefit uh, that evidently brings to the ultra-heavy heaviness, let's say, to be useless to a, to a point. Right. This, of course, in, if you look at the, the the evolution of 
Western armor, etc., we realize that, yes, with increased infantry power and firearms, cavalry for a while does hold, right? Does in invest in, in armor as long as it was useful. The same goes for infantry, as a matter of fact. After a while, just firepower is so big that it's better to invest instead uh, in firepower, so in, in other, you know, handguns than, than armor, and that's how armor never disappears till to, to this day, but uh, it's, um, of course, outmatched most of the time for the most conventional, by the most conventional weapons uh, and arms. Um, so th th this is an important premise, I think, because when you look at the Byzantine um, army at this point, you realize that it was completely normal for the Romans to, to have passed to a lighter type of cavalryman. Uh, telling you the truth, the individual soldier, this is evident throughout all military history, that um, say heavy cavalry tendentially has uh, um, say has more armor in the in the horsemen than in than in the horse, right? This is very evident also in in the Middle Ages. In other words, the needs to have that men at arm, even if unhorsed, exactly because of less protection for the animal, um, is to to save his skin and or to be able to I don't know to withdraw whatever, or to be captured, for example, then increasing uh, the protection for the horse itself, which is. I would say an immense indicator of also the quality of the horseman as well, because the horse was literally just per se a, a, a traumatically impacting and impactingly ex overly expensive thing. Like if you look at the entire military history of cavalry, you realize that, of course, it was not overly expensive in the broader picture, because otherwise it would have not used cavalry. But it's really the horse that consumes the greater lot. People say, oh my god, armor costs so much. But do you have an idea of how much it costs to feed a horse, right? And that, of course, has to be kept alive continuously. So, it, and, and training that uh, together with the horse, it, it's it's a shocking amount of, of, of resources. It's something incredible. I have to make an entire video of multiple hours on this topic to, to picture it concretely, because very often one does not realize how expensive really a horse, and especially a war horse, um, uh, really was, and especially these uh, steeds here that were really massive, and we will look at now what, what, which kind of breeds they used, the, the finest Turkoman ones. I made a video about the Nicaean horse uh, as well, uh, that was, as you know, like the, the non plus ultra, right, in the, the heavenly horse, like when, you know, Augustus takes over Egypt, he, he must get uh, one of, uh, multiple of them, everybody was fixated with this, and generally speaking, like, Think about the same Macedons, uh, etc. The the history of uh, war horse breeds is, is is very beautiful. We should actually talk more about that. Yet the cost element is is relevant because in this historical time, actually material culture is sinking. Like we have Belisarius horsemen in Italy making their own armor out of wood, for example, because metal was so scarcely available. At least it cost so much that. Uh, at, uh, on the market in relative terms that it was complicated and just to keep a force like that. There is also the sense, in fact, that this period witnesses a, ser a series of deep, um, let's say, of, of dismantlement of the construction of what was previously some sort of larger force. This, this actually is true for the Roman army when you consider the Already at the end of the 5th century, I uh, have more videos in counting, especially in Western Roman warfare, where that is more even. But when, when you look actually at the Eastern Roman army as well, you realize that there is this great era uh, after the Constantinian reforms, up to, um, until Adrianople, basically, in which the, um, the system was really big, right? And it had been homogenized to some extent, uh, it was difficult to simply have an orderly system that wouldn't draw, for example, for the units and different um, other administ military aspects of military administration from the previous centuries, 
um, I don't know, the, the, that level of uniformity that the, the Augustan military reforms had brought with the those given legions, those auxiliaries, would never be uh, replicated even for, for the uh, 4th century. It is a moment of great power, great uh, even re-expansion to some extent of um, the Roman imperial force. But after that, you have, you have actually a further collapse, like we often think of just the West as undergoing that. But the Eastern Roman Empire actually suffered the same thing, except it remained under a single political uh, control. In part, we, we can't explain in this video why it happened, it, it, it did not in the West, simply it had to do in part with the fact that um, there was more savagery coming from the outer world, right? The, spe the steppes peoples were in this sense more impacting in Byzantine warfare exactly because they, they really were that closer and, and that more aggressive and so when you look at even this sort of stamp influences you realize that yes there is a, uh, a an important deal of for example of Germanic um, armor but when you look at the typical segmented one or the, the Spangenhelm of at this time it was the, the Italo-Germanic form was very common you realize that even just a Longbird um, Arimanus looked pretty much like, in terms of uh, of at, l at least uh, armor design, pretty much like everybody looked from the Pannonian Steppe to today's Vladivostok, uh, because they were literally just like getting that that design at least from the Steppe as well, together with certain lifestyle. But Germans were more civilized than say the Turks right and even the Persian Empire at this point yes was particularly powerful and reached its um, at least in Sasanian times compared to the um, to the Arsacid one its greatest extent it was really uh, uh, a dreadly uh, force but let's be honest like it, it was the Roman Empire was Constantinople at this point was actually the superior civilization and Persia had its inherent problems and sort of, again, in imparting coherence internally compared to the much sounder Eleno Roman foundations of the Eastern uh, Roman Empire. And as far as that is concerned, you, you also observe, in fact, how the Byzantine military won against the Persian one. But again, it was a great similarity, and when you look at these um, uh, I digress, but the, the point I was making when you look at this heavy cavalryman, much as heavy, well, okay, um, there is a different, uh, definitely Byzantines have a much greater infantry tradition than the Sasanians have, but when it gets to heavy cavalry, of course, both of them are, as you understand here, almost indistinguishable. Um, the same Byzantine lamellar cuirasses uh, shows the, the same Turco Central Asian influence that we're saying before, as does the archery equipment. I talked about Byzantine archery in multiple videos around this era, um, and that that is pretty evident, right? It would remain that this these Eastern influences will remain very strong, but they're mostly from the um, from the steppes as opposed to to Persia proper. Doesn't matter how Iranian Persia in that sense was, and how much the Sasanian Empire um, was influenced by Turkic warfare as well. We're looking essentially at the um, at the same thing. We have written descriptions about um, armor, like there is no um, no again actual evidence of this half armored horse. Uh, iconographically, that together with the long swords brandished um, on tape and slung on their hips, um, that definitely belong to the Iranian and step cavalry tradition. You can look at this armor and say, okay, well, I understand, like, even without significant visual evidence, what this could technically be about were from which tradition stamped and why it had developed uh, in this way and the destructuration of the Byzantine army through for example much more privatized forces think about the Bucellari or 
the increased sort of um, territorialization of certain units, especially in the frontiers, and the also large amount of mercenaries coming from from the Barbaricum at this point are pretty much like uh, think about how multi-ethnic Belisarius' army really was. I mean, that's the degree of the bland, right? But it's not just that, it's it's just the fact that these armies are shrinking and the average Byzantine Caballarius objectively is, is difficult to distinguish even from the average, I don't know, Longobard Arimanus. The various ethnic influences are not... Um, let's say it's obvious that in terms of geographic proximity that would be a greater... I don't know, the, in, in Italy, the, the Italo-Germanic style was something as opposed that you wouldn't find as much as on the Eastern Frontier, but on the Eastern Frontier we know of allegedly tens of thousands of Longbird warriors being fielded in Armenia, for example, um, by, the, by the Byzantine emperors. So also being more specific about what this or that horseman would have looked like in this, not just in the Byzantine Empire, but in the broader, say, Mediterranean, European or Levantine dimension is it's not so relevant after all. We just see, in fact, that the essentials are pretty much similar together with this, you can argue, proto-feudal system that is kicking in because of that civil uh, collapse and uh, increased privatization, for which the half-armored horse guy is also not just a filing rank soldier, but essentially a more important individual. Someone with status that has the capacity also of customizing it, as it had really always been the case, the only truth, even at the time of the public armories, and there still are. Technically, they kick in in the late Roman Empire, not in, I don't say, Augustan times, even though, of course, there were uh, subcontractors um, of public armories since Cicero's times, we know that, um, through him, in fact. But the idea that these guys look a bit more like knights rather than soldiers is out there and so the half armored horse in this incredibly poor material world like the one of the second half of the 16th century really is especially after the the plague um denotes in these heavy uh knights like an incredible power but also in politically and socially but also a specific military training that is one being more in self like individually reliant than it had been the case before you know that with collapse of civilization you have less collective training basically and more individual valor it's actually a weaker military system than than before but it's also not to um Let's say the, uh, the there are some factors such as the destabilization of the system itself, the fact that civilization must take time to sort of reform and readapt. And actually, the Byzantines are very good at this, um, both before and after the Islamic invasions, for example. Um, but also about this, um, especially when we talk about, um, in fact, the the enemies of the time. So a relative relation. These standards of the Byzantine army remain pretty darn high, right? This is very evident. You can argue that, actually, the area of Justinian and one of his immediate successors, until Heraclius, was really the peak of Byzantine civilization as such, which is exemplified, in fact, by the perfect synchrosis between uh, Latin pragmatism and Hellenic theory. Right, and the Saudo Maurice, in fact, is the most beautiful source. Why? Because it's also like among the various Byzantine military treatises that later become very, very much, I don't know, um, classicistic and sort of encyclopedistic, even to some degree. Think about Leo the Wise, it literally copies the, the Saudo Maurice, just adding a two note, it's something a bit more like to, to characterize slightly the, I don't know, the, the new peoples that, however, are called with the same names as before. Um, because, you know, w w th that was the Byzantine mentality, right? What's the difference between an Avar and a Magyar? Of course there were, uh, but to them it's just like Anna Komnena's mm, idea that since, I don't know, the, in Roman times the, 
in the good old Roman times, in, in Gaul there were the Celts, so the uh, the French, the Norman the Crusaders were the the Celtoi, yeah, in Greek. Um, and this is not to say, of course, there was not a Celtic stratum, but the point is that how the, the Byzantines conceptualized that, uh, just in describing a world and sort of lagging behind, even in being able to scope that, um, and in fact being being able to match it, which is instead what the Byzantines are extremely good at doing at this very point. There is, for example, a dramatic uh, um, increase in individual training, also with multiple weapons for the increased needs of specialization um, f- um, within properly the final rank trooper that in, in the Byzantine army sort of remains as a standard. It's sort of paradoxical because of what we said before. While the Sasanians, they were wilder, say, from their Persian background, sort of rationalized more, being coming closer to Roman civilization, uh, establishing a state in, in Mesopotamia, etc. So they, 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 they diversify the, again, the heavy shock element from the, from the light um, missile one. At this point, the same Romans are obliged to increase a bit the individual training at the expense of the collective one, especially because the latter has just collapsed because the state is not as powerful and um, well, you know, resourceful as before. Right, so very high standards, but coming through an adaptation to the current circumstances that were pretty dire um, at the time. We'll talk more about this this period. Of course, they didn't see themselves like, oh my god, we're on the brink of collapse, this is the contraction of the Dark Ages, no. Um, but there is also no doubt that this, there had been a significant destructuration of what had been the Roman state reflected in the military um, as well. Other interesting aspect regarding what especially said about the stirrup is that while the Byzantines take these um, uh, devices from the 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 others and of course they I will have to make a video about this because there is an an enormous scholarly debate regarding not much the direction now that is mostly seen as the again the central European one the by the others right uh, but rather the timing and the actual spread of the syrup after uh, but especially before right especially when you talk about the Byzantine Empire um, in how it had taken place, right? There are some people who say the syrup was there from much before the others um, established themselves in the in the Pannonian in the, in the Carpathian Basin. Um, uh, yeah, okay, sure. Uh, what matters is, however, that these um, more solid um, metal syrups are beginning, like to to be the standard. So evidently. Um, there is a an equal level of heaviness that requires it, and the fact that probably this was that this syrup was not so widespread even about the Sasanian world is that I think among the other things the the fact that the Persians being closer to the spring of equestrian warfare they probably didn't require the syrup more um, than for example some sanitaries that had the structural capacity just of using the stirrup because you see that's the point I mean it doesn't take literally anything to invent or to imagine the stirrup right and the way this technology is adopted is is true a need as any technology basically um, and so you have to understand why would some e- extremely skilled horsemen like the early cataphracts for example wouldn't use a stirrup and they had surely also lots of problems they had probably and a very complex system of straps to keep them um, on horseback. Uh, inorganic material has been lost, but just because at the moment of impact you must remain on horseback, that's a dramatically important thing. There are um, sources from, uh, for example, the Reconquista, uh, claiming that you know Christian knights had to literally chain themselves to, to the saddle because. Otherwise, they would have been literally catapulted at the moment of impact um, when, you know, the, during cavalry charges. And this is absolutely normal, just also for the people who think that, um, ah, no, but cavalry charges didn't really exist. They, they really tried to avoid each other, the impact. No, they, they trained the, the exact, especially in these cases, this heaviest cavalry. 
the way, aside from throughout all military history, we have over overwhelming and notorious events of literally horses, like, knights smashing to one another in, 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 in enormous masses, like just pick about the, the cuirassier charge at Austerlitz or things like that. But literally they were searching for it, right? So this means, in spite of what we pointed out before, that how costly the the horseman was, even before the horse, how needed the necessity of smashing to the enemy, literally properly eliminating its physical consistency in its bodily annihilation, really was to the end uh, of warfare. It's about aggressivity, it's about moral load, it's about being... Uh, capable of taking that risk and um, you know either winning or dying it's really the, the great um, the great ambition of every warrior right and we should talk more about um, combat psychology but also in fact what the beliefs of these individuals really were we, we know pretty well that around the Byzantine army in the Christian times um, like the, the imperial troops had pretty much the same martial um, ethos of, I don't know, a, a classical hoplite uh, in terms of, you know, wanting to emulate Hercules and Achilles, etc. Um, this was perfectly coherent with Christianity as well. That's uh, a thing that people have a hard time understanding, also because it doesn't seem that here the, the, the warlikeness of, say, the, the the level of, of violence and and military eagerness the, of the early medievals ever changed because of Christianization it was, if anything, just a broader exhaustion of the rest uh, of the population that even favored these guys to be ever more sort of elite, right? Um, so I would say that um, the Byzantines were still also capable of adapting, you know, uh, in a more structural way in the adoption of these other population technologies, especially from the step in a structural way, right? This is important because stirrups uh, would not be adopted by other nations in, in the West as uh, early as the Byzantines did. Yes, admittedly, they were, as we just said, closer to the steps themselves, but there is also an eminently a social issue. Uh, why this did not happen? And of course, also the Byzantines did not make, uh, did not make an, an overwhelming larger use of stirrups compared to say I don't know that um, the Franks eventually but you you have to give the latter's time to form a feudal society uh, that would actually surpass the Beth the Byzantine one that really never had a true feudal system this is uh, I think very important when you look at even for example the development of the Nicophorian cataphracts that the, the, by that point Constantinople had a problem in challenging certain military models and sort of there's a great d debate among Byzantinists like whether it would have been better would have not been better for them to for example feudalize right straight away which is actually what the Comnenians do after the, the the last period of the Macedonian dynasty that had tried sort of maintaining um, something to Basil the Hank and in terms of that public sort of peasant soldier idea um, and that collapse d during the, the rest of the 11th century uh, and um, but this is in fact for another for another video, I would say. Right? It seems also another way the Byzantines distinguished themselves compared to the to the Sasanians is that their horses had an extra plume dangling from the breast strap on each side. Um, but we're also not overwhelmingly informed about how statistically true this this, this was. In any case, um, the identical probably will make a, a very similar video as far as the Sasanian half armored horse is concerned because it's literally the same. Those guys would have been the, the typical horses for the later Klibanari, right? We'll talk about this type of uh, the Grivan par actually. Um, that's the etymology, not the the other, for example, Latin ones from which the term actually it, it, it would be a Latinization of, of the original Persian. The reason why we can describe or typologize a uh, Justinian era Byzantine half 
armored horse is that we have substantial Persian units. Um, that in the Sasanian case is also quite well uh, decorated, also colored to some extent. Uh, we will see it, especially for the saddles, where it was all an interest. Especially the Persians had not necessarily the Byzantines, right? The Byzantines at this point get a, a lot, but I mean really a lot of stuff from Persia, right? Just in terms of court. Um, uh, dress, rituals, uh, and also in the military, of course. This is even in the first half of the 7th century. This was true also, as far as the as the Persians had gotten an enormous deal out of um, Roman statehood administration, and, and also in the military, as far as, for example, siege warfare was concerned. I mean, the Parthians notoriously sucked, were picked by anyone uh, in, in the past, because they couldn't besiege effectively a settlement but that's all that must be also contextualized so here in the picture like you have a a, a scale armor of sort um, the squamai um, the armor was thus made of metal lamille lamelle I made a video about lamellar armor in general if you're interested uh, in that when you look at the headpiece, um, you could see something either in plate or leather. So the chamfron was, of course, the most important part of the horse armor, as much as the helmet would be for, for the knight um, in, in many ways. Yet there were different degrees, of course, of hardness. Um, organic armor was out there. Uh, it was uh, really part of that degree of, again, it costs less, it protects less, but maybe you can armor more troops with that. And this depended in many ways on the degree of, like, who was this guy in the first place, right? Here we're not talking about the half-armored horse as just one type of of horse. Here, um, armor is intended mostly as design. Uh, and of course, we tend to speak mostly about the ultra heavily armored because they are the not just the most important on the battlefield, but also the um, just the better documented historically, right? But you have to mention, of course, always a level of organic protection, padded armor, leather armor, whatever. Even for for the chamfron, right? From the from the headpiece. Um, speaking of the eye protection here I wasn't able to reproduce it because I generated this thing with AI uh, not that it's I mean the the actual design is, is taken from from an actual drawing but you know just to make the background and all this stuff AI sucks I must tell you it's not able to do anything um, nor in Britain nor in um, uh, in uh, in artistic visual form at least of course you can't do a lot with that there are very refined means but I'm not using them also I just like to make videos my own way, and um, you know, uh, so far the, the AI uh, available is incredibly unreliable from a historical point of view. Um, uh, in any case, um, this is not so important. But when you look at the eye here, of course, it's not the horse eye, but it's supposed to at least be the the sketch, like the drawing of a sort of T strainer eye protection. So essentially, a um, sort of bulb with all little uh, holes in it so that the horse can see but still having the eye, the eye protected. Um, just imagine what the medieval knights did with the eye slits, you know, getting always thinner, etc. So this was particularly important also because the, the horse in Byzantine Persian warfare is, and I think this is very important because it, it, it was the actual origin of, of cataphractness in many ways not much the heaviness of of the breed of the shock force that could have been handled even with a with a less uh, armored horse the problem is that there was a lot of arrows around right and so that the, the, the cataphract at least as a broader model of have to be you know armored everywhere even in the rear 
which in fact the, the concept of half armored horse is a bit the mitigation of is that a missile would come from everywhere it's like what we've seen for the mid uh, 13th century plate armor spread that seemingly had to do with you know the, the meeting of western and mongol warfare to some extent it would have happened anyway and knights would have just become fully armored later on just because if you can afford that it's increased protection and so it's fine so that's the general principle of armor but you understand of, uh, why of course did the, the more um, protected part of the horse would be the frontal one um, and uh, I, th I don't think we need an explanation for this um, and especially the concentration of missile uh, and just all the, the problems like deriving from smashing to frontally as we were saying before against um, other pretty aggressive horsemen and horses because horses are very aggressive like especially these were selected among some of the most um, I mean the war horses selected among the most aggressive of the bunch of horses but they're properly trained to beat to to attack to punch with the hooves um, and they are really uh, horses are incredibly dangerous if they set their mind on on harming you otherwise they're incredibly intelligent and beautiful animals and that's in fact the, the you know the useful part also as far as the the aggressive uh, military side of the story is concerned they do understand they have to defend the rider and, uh, and so they have to be adequately protected themselves of what they have to do um, in alternative to these eye protections there were also sometimes really eye holes so no protection at all um, the saddle here it's actually a you know a simpler form we will see it better in the Sassanian half armored horse how there were more distinctively Persian styles uh, especially taller saddles uh, they were used by the Byzantines as well the sense is is that th there is a bigger structure there to handle um, together with with a bigger horse mostly um, you have to f to fix again the the horsemen a bit more on horseback uh, it would be typical of course of the heavier guys to be the, the least likely to dismount but there is also a big deal of that um, in fact in the this Byzantine men at arms you see it with, with the Germans the, the South of Strategicon talks about that uh, extensively um, and of course the guys who rode these beasts were also some of the most athletic out there just you don't functionalize yourself necessarily for mounting and dismounting um, um, if at least you're aiming to have that kind of ultra heavy cavalry that you have just to use as a shock reserving collective uh, charges right um, but of course as far as the individual goes he could he wouldn't be employed just in that circumstance and generally speaking those were the same guys who received also the greater training also with all different kind of weapons and so they would be able at least to, to do that even if the heavier the word the, the more exhausted it would become the, the more quickly they would become uh, especially and that's very important in combat um, so if we look at later Sasanian art before it would, you know the Persians were wiped out um, at least in, as, as a state um, because militarily speaking they kept influencing dramatically for example Arab warfare we'll talk about this at some other point um, and you know that that is true also for much later times of the Seljuks we've seen it multiple units of the time and how of course the Byzantines kept receiving through them a lot of um, Persian culture, Persified culture at least. We, um, we can observe saddles of very different colors. We tend to forget this aspect. Armies, um, medieval times were some of the single most colorful thing that you can ever imagine. Um, you would see gold, yellow, dark, light blue, red, almond, green, white, um, so a, a really wide array of colors that as we've seen in the videos about uniforming and uh, you know in military culture all have a very specific transcendental meaning right they're not random they are all together with the symbols with the houses the Persians especially would have that more feudal culture that had some sort of proto-heraldic 
um, differentiation uh, in nature. They were much more feudally equestrian than the Byzantines at, at the highest levels, right? Because um, they were more hybrid also with the steppe world to some degree than, than the Byzantines at the end of the day were, were sedentary. The different, uh, say, the different coloring goes also with the saddle cloth. Of course, they would make pandan to some extent, or there were still different uh, colors combination. Uh, you find white ship skin, dark blue, almond green, dark green, red, leopard skin, and yellow. Um, all these had to do with the old idea, of, for example, the killing the ferocious animal. How much you find this in the per in Persian art, right, from Achaemenid times and before uh, the the Assyrians, also in the in Mesopotamia. Uh, the 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 great beast of nature is tamed, is killed, is a bit like slaying the dragon. Uh, the same Alexander had leopard skin. This was again typically normal. Think about the berserker, the Ulfenars, the the Roman NCOs. I mean, they all bought into this kind of thing. And the colors here were perhaps part of broader conceptualization uh, than than in the West. It was always much more sort of uh, artistically. Uh, uh, more artistically contemplative and sort of more complex and deeper, whereas in the East you find sort of more conceptualized ideas, even though not necessarily corresponding to some more advanced military as we've seen. Um, and I can't digress on why this was the case. In any case, the, cent the, the closer you are to the Central Asian steps and the more you find an emphasis on, of course, the moral dimension, the spiritual dimension, um, and not much the material one because things were incredibly expansive in the first place and so the idea is these this, this guys at the outskirts of civilization and have to literally to to suicide themselves or at least to risk that um, in order to gain right to get out of the step and gaining something in the richer places and so re relying mostly on moral force rather than civilizational wealth materially speaking uh, and so the Sasanians this play a little bit more of that compared to the Romans, but they're also, again, we have to talk about Persian religion and more, but I think you know what, what I'm talking about. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean a better thing, right? What the, the Byzantine Empire through Christianization had undergone is also something very specific. It's a reflection on the spiritual capacity of mankind to transcend. So it, it fits it, it, its history. In many ways, and it's not necessarily a, a a formal model without substance that will make the thing, or vice versa. By the way, so you always have to calibrate that. Um, and when you look at both saddle and saddle clothes, you you realize that all these colors came together with decorations in in these other various colors, or in gold, especially was of course um, God's color. After all, the same Sasanians had gone towards a form of anotheism and the fact that they, the, there was a single god for everyone, right? These uh, empires were just rediscovering that in a more, in fact, transcendental sense um, that we decided to call monotheism as opposed to an alleged polytheism that, of course, never existed. Uh, as such, god is always and exclusively, and by traditional definition, one, right? What people confuse is other gods' hypotheses and sort of declinations of the one force and and think that there was a, literally like something like a polytheistic pantheon. That, that's not how they, they themselves believed in that. Um, there was a, a whole lot of decoration, just like the medieval knights with the surcoat, with the crests, and etc. Um, the more feudal the culture, the more you see this individual overloaded with decorations. The forehand plumes, for example, or plumes hanging at, at the flanks to act as fly switches. There were also some, as we'll see now, sensorial reasons why these were created. There were tail ribbons, but and especially from um, the steps, like small tufts or tiny bells hanging from the armor. And we've seen it l literally throughout the entire step warfare videos because the steps also don't change as fast as the 
the sanitary world. They, they actually do. There, there are important transformation. But that transcendental closeness that we were talking about before entailed as well in this broader risk of the heavenly, um, let's say, uh, let's say self-sacrifice in holy combat. That the bells, like this, was a bit like the hissing of uh, the sound of the of the Draco standards. Uh, we've seen it very often. The same uh, Mongol arrows, you know, meant to hiss at the end to sound when shot. Um, had to maximize the psychological effect, but again, the the staff's peoples had to because lack of of more, um, and that would have embodied essentially the Emily, let's say the cosmic divine harmony, literally sounding um, with this. It was technically music to some. I mean, not technically, but conceptually, um, in, in the idea that by these guys and their weapons and their gear that divine power w was being manifested through the sound right there is in this transcendental mentality and I made a video about this in um, Islamic military music given that Muslim culture is iconoclastic the much greater reliance on uh, sounds right and this comes from also other reasons such as the fact, the same, for example, the, the largest amount of horse archers, the fact that they had to be, um, they were more difficult to drill because technically the horse archer is just a lighter troop. It doesn't have to be arrayed in an actual formation, at least during the course of combat. They, they would have them to some extent, but not as the bulkier heavy cavalry, and especially the broader armies of sedentary civilization. So they, in order to control them better, they used music. Um, uh, there were different instruments corresponding to the, of course, the, the highest pitched sounds, like the trumpets were destined to the heavenly figures, like whereas the, the drums were more for the chthonic, uh, lesser individuals. Um, but they were functional to that purpose as well. I mean, the, the, the trumpet hits on the tympanon when you have to launch the charge. It's, it's something much more exalted. I mean, look at the old, the, I don't know, cavalry um, music. Right, and they are all, in that sense, Apollonian instruments they're played with. Whereas the the rolling of the drum, especially for the infantry, something going on. But actually, for the horse archery, that had to remain more or less coalescing around the heavy cavalry was was also used in this context. There is, in fact, enormous load of continuity, especially from Persian military music, in Persian military music from um, pre. Islamic and post-Islamic time, Islamic times, let's say, um, there is a, an old video, I, I could re-upload it, but again, it's not too important just per se. Um, in any case, uh, the there were other features definitely coming from the steps. For example, the tail, uh, the horse tail was tied up to reduce the chance of it providing a handhold to an intending hamstringer. Steps people tended to to prove um, the youth's valor by literally, again, going to this suicidal task of as unarmored youth because they, they were really not accomplished and powerful and they had to do this to some extent even in just in this vicious training. It's not that different from Takis's Germans that you know are excited to look at this naked youth literally you know impaling themselves and on this spear's track that they had, you know, created for them, just like a game. Um, but um, the probably going uh, behind, arriving behind, and so the highest sort of uh, gotcha moment of the heavily armored guy that is so focused, and for especially for the frontal clash, that has sort of forgotten the youthful. Of quickness, and so he's also destined to to fall. But it, that is dramatically more powerful than a youth um, that is also again uh, as opposite lightly armored. It can in fact perform this sort of stunts and pulling the this guy's horse tail, and so mocking him and proving to the others that yeah, you're crazy, you're mental, you're able to literally suicide yourself. So you're you're part of our pack because that's exactly what we need especially at that age, for the tasks that we have to provide you. 
It was a thing noblemen did, um, and it was crazy to tell you how this, how traumatic this and messed up the step really was mentally, but also that was the best functionalization that they had in order to foster more effective troops. Again, these are features that the Byzantines adopt from the Persians as well, um, and the latter in turn were, had been adopting for other Central Asian peoples, from Central Asian peoples, and so they did not literally. You know, they would do that, actually, especially the in Persia. This is true also in Seljuk time. You, you find it, right? But the, the bells, for example, those can be attached without any much greater meaning. Just you have to manifest yourself, right? And it was particularly important for these heavily armored guys that took the field by... and it, For which they had to be noticed. They weren't they had to be swift or hidden or whatever, these were the guys we had to intimidate the enemy because they had, as we've seen, to smash into them. Um, and so to maximize that level of fear in the enemy even before the, the impact, the physical impact uh, occurred, right? Uh, there had been some transformations also in the felt armor. Uh, this is perhaps not so, so relevant. Speaking of the type of horse uh, we're not like 100% sure what horses looked like exactly at the time meaning that I say it's just like studying human genetics right and except the latter is sort of much better uh, let's say documented in spite of the fact that documenting human genetics is also extremely difficult in some ways you can imagine horses that had all a different type of just of existence, just the way they were bred, they were uh, just uh, uh, they, they were kept in some places, how they were killed, how they were consumed in, in some instances, and the, the different degree of burial, for example. So um, we can think among the say compared from a comparative point of view, the modern breeds. This type of horse, especially for in, from the Persian side, something similar to the Akal Teke, Turkoman one, right? It's surely the nearest existing relative to the type of horses at least the Sasanians used for these heavier guys, which is actually a pretty large one uh, for the time, something between 150 and 160 centimeters um, in, in height. Uh, on, on average, to this type of units we can think mostly the lower end, rather. But of course, this could vary easily. And remember that everything, including the horse, was sort of um, adapted in different ways. I mean, with armor it was easier. With horses, it, it depends on, on the availability of them. Plus, to the rider as well. So of course, aside from size, what, what really matters is the type of relation. Um, uh, you cannot have a good cavalry in the first place would say a good horse and a bad horseman and vice versa and especially if these two do not risk their life together and they're aware of that and horses really are um, they must trust each other in some of the most ter terrifying moments and again literally horses are aware of this they knew what they were going into um, and also because they also practice that and, and, and literally lead through the events um, speaking of the Sasanian horses represented on the various monuments, we, we don't not see them to be particularly tall. At, at least the the art was not meant to focus on that, rather on the actual bulk of the horse, like how wide and deep the body was, right? Uh, and in fact, this is superior. Uh, these characteristics are higher than the one of a modern tour command that has, in fact, a uh, sort of um, thinner uh, build. These horses were evidently very muscular and powerful. And again, especially the, the Sasanians were obsessed with that because they had the, the greater feudal culture around. The Byzantines, however, would praise these guys as well. Uh, we've seen how, in fact, the Persian, let's say the, the Central Asian, because that's what they were. They weren't technically Persian breeds. They were Central Asian breeds. Were used by the 
the Greeks, let's say, in Hellenistic times, were their cataphract horses. Um, and that these were massive beasts. Again, enormous. There was an enormous market behind them. And we will perhaps talk even better about them. But again, I made a video that is titled Persian Cavalry Horse because that's for the um, Persian Wars series. But uh, it talks also about the... I mean, the the, the per say that the, you can call it Persian in as much as it was, of course, imported in Persia and bred further there. But of course, the main, the best springs were Central Asia. The ones that they, the Chinese called the heavenly horses, and that were thought to sweat blood because they were so bulky and powerful. But actually, that was due to a to a parasite for which they literally. Um, exuded blood like from at least they it was stamped from the skin um but that sense of again of the blood and the dirt and of this powerful ectonic but also highly heavenly animals that could elevate the hero to to the sky like if, if he knew how to ride them to transfigure their ectonic dimension was all there and basically everybody at the time was fixated with this especially the turks uh, what was left of the Iranians uh, and the same Persians and by osmosis the Byzantines would have been keenly aware of, of this and surely the Byzantine emperors spent quite a lot for also importing these breeds and giving them to, to their military uh, the, the nobility in general would just want to have these guys um, and that's what increases over time in history even though here also d different breeds will come in the centuries but I mean the idea that even in the Pranoya system the, the this type of cavalry that was developed was ever more uh, reliant on this heavy mount rather than other ones um, and speaking of like at least today's Turkomans, the finest ones, have a uh, strange but sort of beautiful color, um, almost metallic bronze. And though that indicates the highest quality, the the best breed, right? And so uh, they, they were incredibly uh, selected in terms of racial purity because they tended to acquire those characteristics together with again this military functionality and it, it's always interesting to talk about war horses because mm, say this is just for the from the unit type series but there is always a lot about the actual zoology behind that uh, how we think the history like of these breeds that are uh, that is particularly important if you think about that history of cavalry everybody again is fixated with with a stirrup that didn't really change uh, a great much just per se it was just an adaptation even to particular mounts but particular tactics especially um, and in fact most people instead ignore the uh, mostly the the animal which is actually together with the knight the human the the the, the equine factor right the, and and the combination of, of the two that, that is by far the most important one is always in warfare it's all about combining forces a synergic principle uh, to transcend reality um, and to actually mold it uh, in, in your own image which is what these guys believe um, well you know think about that that's what really matters all right uh, this was as far as this, this type of unit uh, is concerned there is really a lot more that could have said but overall you know uh, these videos are they last long they're however some sort of compendia after all they're not the more heavily researched ones also because we literally know too few like we we have like if you open a, a book about B the Byzantine army at the time if they, they tell you notoriously that there's no such thing like this early cataphract 
a representation for the Byzantines, and so we have to collect evidence from here and there. Um, and um, that's um, sort of pretty much it. Uh, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.